everybody in today's video orthopedic tutor will talk about developmental dysplasia of the hip further on in this video i will refer to this condition as ddh and in this type of pathology i will discuss it in two videos and the first video will cover the basics and the next basics and diagnosis and the next one will cover the management and post management programs well let us start with the basics so ddh is usually also known as the congenital dysplasia of the hip there are certain types of patient that has the increased risk of having this kind of condition which is if they have positive family history it is a left-sided and there is also uh, increased estrogen there is a bridge positioning of the patient of the baby uh, intrauterine and it, the girls are usually in a higher risk of developing DDH and for the associated condition since you need to know that DDH is also associated with a tight or a small room intrauterine and so there are various conditions that may be associated with it which include torticollis which is uh, also known as a right neck condition and torticollis you can see that the patient's neck is usually laterally turned and rotated towards the other side they could also be associated with metatarsus adductus in which there is a adductus deformity of the first ray and then you could also see that there is uh, it is sometimes associated with congenital knee dislocation or increased collagen type 3 while in the body has loads of collagen types and type 1 and type 2 is the ones you usually found in our musculoskeletal system and type 3 is not the good type now now for the incidence usually dysplasia it has a rate of around 1 in 100 babies born and this location is found in 1 over 1,000 uh, baby born and you need to know that there's a big difference here between dysplasia and dislocation because dysplasia means that the body's structures are not forming the way they should form and therefore these subtypes of patient has a higher risk of developing a dislocation so these dysplasia can lead to a dislocation now moving on you need to know that the DDH is actually a abnormal development or dislocation of the hip which is caused secondary to the capsular laxity and also other mechanical factors and there are various spectrum of these conditions it could start with what I've just told you dysplasia which basically just means that your body is not forming the way it should be and usually the acetabulum or uh, the bowl that covers your femoral head is shallow and it could go on to be a subluxated condition or even dislocated and it could also be a teratologic type then the teratologic subtype can also be differentiated into the ones that occur in utero it is usually irreducible and it is frequently associated with these two syndromes which is the arthrogryposis and also the larsen syndrome now at the end very end spectrum of this condition the ddh could present as a late dysplasia which could be seen in adolescent and adult patient so because this patient generally does not have a normal structures since they are born this patient are usually also prone to all those changes that may occur at a normal patient at an older age such as osteoarthritis or other conditions associated with it now the, for the etiology itself the ddh can have several things that are connected to it the first would be the risk factors there are loads of risk factors and during exam these are usually frequently asked for the bridge position and you could see here that due for the bridge positioned baby it is also it is usually associated with a ddh and it could be a double bridge position it could be a single floating bridge a uh, uh, bridge a uh, position it also could be a frank bridge here in which the risk of developing ddh is up to 20 percent and there could be a positive 
family history, positive family history of ligamentous laxity especially. It is also frequently found in female population up to 6 over 1. And firstborn is usually also associated with DDH. Remember that once again, DDH is usually formed in patients who are while well, being conceived is in a very small womb in which they, they are not free to move their limb and that is why in firstborn where generally there is less space DDH is very commonly found and also in patients with oligohydramnion in which the amniotic fluid is lacking and it is also associated with postnatal postnatal meaning that the positioning of the patient after being born and it is highly associated with patient's population where swaddling is still done. Now, this swaddling position is very common in certain Native American population, but it's also common in certain Asian population or Southeast Asian population. Because of the baby's leg, when they are born, they are usually positioned like this. Slightly flexed, slightly abducted and usually the knee is also flexed but when you swaddle a baby usually the whole hip is extended the knee is forcefully extended and all of those forceful manipulation causes the hip to actually subluxate or even dislocate out of its normal position and that in combined with the baby's inherent ligamentous laxity makes it altogether possible to cause DDH only by positioning the patient using a swaddle. And the next would be the pathoanatomy of the DDH. Well, as you can see here that the initial instability for developing a DDH is caused by both maternal factors but also it is caused by fetal factors. The maternal factors that have an influence to the baby's uh, progression to DDH includes maternal laxity, while the fetal point here is that the fetal's position determine the possibility of developing DDH, such as the bridge position that is being mentioned before. Next would be afterwards, the initial disability will lead or will progresses into a dysplasia. Dysplasia is usually found in certain conditions and in the spastic CP or cerebral plasty, cerebral, sorry, cerebral palsy, we, uh, in the spastic type, you could also see a dysplasia over the posterior superior dislocation and in the usual type of dysplasia, you see a typical acetabular deficiency which is situated at the anterior or anterolateral part and this dysplasia will slowly but surely progress into a gradual dislocation. So what you see here is a way for the DDH to develop starting from the initial instability and then moving on to the dysplasia and then to the high risk of gradual dislocation. Next is for the classification. Classification is easily made if the clinical findings are already determined. The patient could be classified as frankly dislocated with the whole head of femur out of its place or it could be a dislocatable hip in which the femoral head is still inside the acetabulum but with additional force from external forces the hip can be dislocated and next is subluxatable which means that with external forces the hip could go out of its place but is not dislocated you might need to differentiate that dislocated means that there is no longer any contact between the two joint surfaces of the femoral head and the acetabulum while in subluxated condition there is still some con some contact between the head of femur and also the acetabulum now for the dislocated type you could say that sometimes it is still reducible sometimes it is irreducible while for the dislocatable type usually you could see the findings of positive Barlow test or for the reducible and irreducible you could differentiate it using the Ortolani 
method and we'll discuss about this later on in this video for the sublock table it is usually determined by finding a barlow suggestive findings now let us see this chart here okay this is the pathology of a dislocatable hip as you can see here that the hip is very very prone to dislocation and these are considered an unstable hip you could see here that the capsule here is stretched and very loose which means that the femoral head can slip out of its place because there is a place for it to slip and then the ligamentum teres is very elongated when this is elongated it gives the femoral head a chance to escape out of its place and you could also see here that the labrum the labrum is sort of like the lip of the acetabulum it is averted it means that it, it, it is not keeping this femoral head inside its place and you can see here in this B picture here that there's a complete displacement of the femoral head out of the acetabulum and at the fibrocartilage and hyaline junction of the labrum with the acetabulum there could also be hypertrophic changes here and you could see here that the labrum also inverts and averts here and the ligamentum teres same as this one is readily very elongated the head has gone out of its place to this uh, and enters this loosely stretched capsule you could see here that the acetabulum is also dysplastic. There's hardly a bowl there. It should it should have the shape of a bowl, which contains this femoral head. But you can see here that it is more like a saucer here, like a plate, where you cannot see clearly the bowl. That is a dysplastic acetabulum. And next, you can see here in this picture, this is a pathology of the unstable hip that is subluxatable but not dislocatable which means that the hip could go a little bit out of its place but still not enough for it to actually be dislocated this one is a normal hip here you see there's no redundant capsule over here the ligamentarius is not elongated and the labrum as we see here is inverted as opposed to the ones earlier which is everted you could see here that when the labrum is slightly inverted and the capsule is slightly stretched, then the hip can go out of its place, out of the acetabulum, but it's not enough for it to dislocate. And we call this an subluxatable hip. And the last one would be the pathology of this dislocated hip and it's not readily reducible. It cannot go back to its place naturally go back to its place because of several obstacles you need to be familiar with the terms obstacles because these obstacles needs to be released or needs to be addressed during the surgery you can see here that there are various obstacles here starting from the inverted labrum so it blocks it became a door that blocks the femoral head from entering the entering back into the joint space and you can see here as same as before there's a elongated ligamentum terrace but as you can see here this yellowish picture here this actually depicts that there is a fibro fatty pulvina fibro fatty pulvina is like a mixture of soft tissue and fat and all sorts of debris that fills up the bowl of this acetabulum and it becomes a padding that somehow when the hip is trying to go back in this becomes something that blocks it from entering this surface here and this also needs to be addressed this yellowish thing needs to be taken up during surgery and as you can see here this is also an obstacle this is the capsule you could see here that if this capsule here is tight you cannot pull it back downwards because it leaves no more space for the femoral head. If this capsule here is still redundant, is still loose, then the femoral head has a chance of getting in. But this constricted capsule here also blocks the reduction of the femoral head. Next, we will talk about how to raise the diagnosis of DDH. As you can see here that DDH can present to us in several 
stages of life it could come to us when the baby is just born it could come to us several months after we are born or sometimes in neglected case it could come to us at a late stage when the baby is actually already walking now for the history taking you need to take a complete history starting from prenatal birth to postnatal and that should include questioning all those risk factors that is discussed earlier which is all of these needs to be addressed and asked with the parents and physical findings as i mentioned before differs according to the age of when the patient is found if the patient came to us as at a very early age of let's say less than three months then you could find all of these various different findings such as asymmetrical folds over at the uh, inguinal region and you could also see this classic sign. This classic sign says when you put your finger one over at the, yeah, you put two, uh, two of your fingers here and you draw an imaginary line through it with one finger over the greater trochanter, which is this one, and the other one in the ASL, which is the antero superior iliac spine. When you draw a line, usually it should point towards the umbilicus but when the hip is dislocated the hip goes out the femoral head goes out along with the femoral greater trochanter and it reach a higher place as you can see here that the middle finger goes slightly proximal and it no longer points to the umbilicus but slightly below the umbilicus this is called the classic test and next is the famous barlow test the barlow test is actually a test while the patient is positioned such as uh, depicted here and when the examination is positive the examiner will feel that the femoral head, head makes a small jump out of the acetabulum so the examiner is actually pushing the whole femur out of its place so we, the examiner is trying to dislocate the hip and that is called the barrel test as for the Ottolani test, actually the examiner is doing the opposite where they are trying to put back the femoral head back into its place over the acetabulum and you are trying to relocate this test. And through this Ottolani test, you could determine whether this patient's hip is reducible or not reducible. Okay, and the other examination that you could do is the Galeazzi test which uh, determines the length of the uh, leg. You could position the patient supine, the whole hip and knee flex, and you can just observe from the foot region the height of the knee of the patient. If there, there is a difference in height, then it could be a congenitally short femur or it could be a dislocated knee, uh, hip. Next would be if the patient came to us at an later stage of life which is over three months you need to know that when patient uh, when a baby's hip is suspected to have a ddh or we say that the hip is probably going to dislocate there then there could be other factors such as ligamentous laxity that needs to be put in mind but generally after three months those effects caused by ligamentous laxity are gone and you can uh, safely sh uh, find that any positive findings means it's a DDH. It's a definite DDH. But if in a patient with at an early age, very early age, under three months, you find a positive physical findings of these Barlow or Torani, doesn't mean they directly have DDH. Only they have a chance of uh, getting a dislocated hip. Now for the patients with age over three months, you could see that the soft tissue contracture has already developed and Ortolani and Bardol are rarely positive in this patient population. But what you can find here is that there's a limited hip abduction as seen here. For the normal hip, you could abduct it all the way 80 degree, but for the dislocated hip you could do up to only around 40 degree. You could also see here that there is a leg length discrepancy with asymmetrical uh, inguinal region uh, fold or thigh fold here. You could see here that the right 
lower limb here appears to be shorter and there's also asymmetrical skin fold now for the patient's age more than one year up to the age of walking child what you will, you would expect to see is pelvic obliquity pelvic obliquity means that it is not at the same level it means that it is obliquely placed and this is usually caused by the difference of the leg length you could see here that the femoral uh, head is out of the acetabulum and to compensate for this shortened uh, apparently shortened uh, femur the patient usually stands on their toes to equate the length of the leg but you could see here that this patient has positive trendelenburg gait in trendelenburg gait it means that when uh, you perform the test it's called the trendelenburg test when you stand on uh, the healthy side of your limb here and you you can see here that the body it balances very well because the functioning of the hip abductus which is this red muscle here is working really well at maintaining the stability of the pelvic it remains level with the floor but when this patient with right ddh is asked to stand on their dislocated hip you could see here that this muscle is not functioning well because of its shortened muscle length and it is also not fixated well because the hip is already out you could see here that this muscle cannot pull this pelvic and maintain it at an equal or parallel to the ground and as a compensation the body also leans toward the affected side you can see here that since this pelvic has dropped the patient tends to lean to the other side or to the affected side so that the whole body doesn't fall onto the ground if the spine remains straight then the patient would fall to his or her left side and this is called a positive trendelenburg test now toe walking as you've seen here in this picture is clearly depicted when the leg length is different the patient will try to walk on their toes so that the leg length seem to be okay now that would be all for today's video the next video regarding ddh or the second part would discuss more about the additional examination and also the management plan that is being advised for patients with ddh i hope you enjoyed this video please subscribe to the orthopedic tutor for more videos thank you